Okay, welcome back. Uh, we stopped off at chapter seven. We completed that. Uh, all right, from now, we just go a little bit quicker because uh, uh, we have to also look at the cross and the blood. And uh, and so we'll just move a little quick. Uh, so now we've established the importance of the old covenant. We established the importance of the new covenant. We established the differences and how uh, you know the old covenant is what it what it brought out and what the new covenant is. So from now we we, we will just look at a few points, but we'll go we'll move a little quick so that we can get to uh, the cross and the blood as well next. All right, let's go to chapter eight, and we look at the old covenant and new covenant contrasted. Just a few points here, right? Uh, so we look at what the old covenant brought forth and the new covenant. Now there uh, there are certain similarities. And there are definitely there are uh, even differences, right? Uh, both the old covenant and the new covenant were blood covenants. So we studied that, right? Uh, old covenant, Abraham and Moses, God gave uh, a blood covenant. New covenant, the Lord Jesus, right? The old was given through Moses. The new is given through Christ Jesus. John chapter 1 verse 17 says, For the law was given through Moses, Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, right? The old based on law, the new based on grace. Now, I just want to point out a few things here. The law, the word law itself is sounds very legalistic, right? Uh, law, okay, you need to follow these rules, right? So the Lord, so God in the Old Testament, he, he gave Moses this, uh, Ten Commandments, and then followed up uh, with the different other laws and how to, you know, uh, uh, live uh, uh, political laws, uh, personal laws, and uh, family laws. So many other laws, uh, and so the old covenant was based on the law. You have to follow these rules, uh, and it was not bad. It was not that okay. These rules were like bringing them nowhere no it, it brought some order it brought them closer to god but the new covenant is is not the on based on the law which is you know on instructions but it is based on grace because of the finished work of christ right now what does it mean it does not mean that okay because i'm in grace i don't have to you know uh uh, read the Old Testament, or I don't have to understand uh, what what was written in the Old Testament. No, uh, the 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 way we come into God's presence, the Old Covenant, it is through the law. We say, okay, God Yahweh, I fulfilled my law. I fulfilled my side of the covenant, so I'm coming into uh, to give this sacrifice. But in the New Covenant, we come in by the grace of God. Lord, I'm coming. Even though I have sinned, even though I have failed you, even though I have not kept the commands that you have, even though I may have been disobedient or uh, have, have, have fallen short, I still come, not by my own merit, but by your grace, by the cross, I'm coming. So that is so powerful. Right? We must understand this difference. When the, in the old covenant, they come into the tabernacle. It, it, when they do their offering, it was like saying, I'm fulfilling the law, God. Here, I'm saying, God, I'm, I, I haven't fulfilled the law. I haven't, I've not been able to kept, keep all the commandments. But yet, I'm coming by your grace. And the wonderful part is, in the old covenant, uh, if without fulfilling the law, you, you, you know, you, you still could not see... Uh, God, you could not have this relationship with God because of the sin. But in the new covenant, while we were yet sinners, while we are in sin also, it is the grace of God. Uh, and we still have this relationship with God. So it's so much more, uh, you know, wonderful. The old covenant brought guilt, but the new covenant brought, brings righteousness. Guilt is something that is... Uh, you know, it, it is a, it is a, it, it, it is something that can bring death in a person's life. Remember Judas. He went. He betrayed Jesus. Probably he thought, okay, they'll just beat him up and uh, beat up Jesus and let him go. 
probably he thought about that way. Okay, just for the money, I'll take the money. I'll betray him. They'll lock him up. Maybe they'll beat him for a few days. They'll leave him after a week or some after some time. But little did he know that the crowd will say crucify him. That's why he 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 even when he went to return it, they didn't accept it because of guilt. He committed suicide. Guilt is from the enemy. Guilt can eat us up on the inside. Right? I I know of a friend of mine who, uh, uh, you know, his he had very loving. He has a very loving parents. Uh, I, I also knew his parents also. Very very good parents. You know, the very God fearing parents. But they would always say, you know, uh, uh, you know, change your ways. You know, go to church. You know, why why do you have to live like this? Uh, give your life to Christ. Walk in a good manner. Get a job. Do something with your life. But he would, you know, get upset and shout at his parents, and uh, you know, he would really, you know, ill treat them. And all of a sudden, his father had a heart attack uh, and passed away. Just went right. A healthy man uh, had a heart attack. He passed away. Now this this young boy. He was a young man, was filled with guilt all through his college life. He was guilty, saying, I did not look after my parents. I did not respect my parents. Yes, he accepted Christ later on, but that guilt was still there in him. I wish I could see my father. I wish I could you know, make things right. Uh, the Old Testament brought guilt upon the people. But the New Testament brings a right standing before God. I remember having this conversation with him. I told him, when the Lord Jesus died on the cross, he took your guilt. He took that shame. Now your father will, you know, when he sees you now, he will be so happy. It's all right. We all make these mistakes. Uh, but don't let guilt, because it's a work of the devil. Then we are we are glorifying the enemy. We are saying, okay, enemy, come, you know, work in my life. No, so I brought out this whole thing. The old covenant brings guilt, but the new covenant, you have a right standing before God. So you don't have to walk in guilt. You don't have to be live a life of, uh, you know, uh, being guilty of the things that we've done. Uh, walk in righteousness, a right standing before God. The old was written, uh, was a letter of the law. The new is a, written in, in our hearts. Uh, we saw that earlier on as well. Circumcision of the heart, which is changing of the heart. Uh, in the old covenant, they probably just had the law, uh, you know, uh, and they would read it. There was no change in the heart. What does John the Baptist rebuke the, you know, the Jews and the leaders? And he says, uh, you brood of vipers, uh, you, you are you're just talking about the law, but your hearts are still like stone. And then in the new covenant, it is, you know, that heart of stone is removed, the heart of flesh is given. The old was based on human effort, but the new is based on the on faith empowered by the Holy Spirit. Very important. Human effort in the old covenant. God, I'm going to do this, I'll do this, I'll do. It's more of doing things in the presence of God. You know, I will do this sacrifice. I will get this done. I will uh, I will do the tithings. I will, uh, you know, I'll do the peace offering, the guilt offerings. I will complete all of those. It's more of works. But in the new covenant, it is faith empowered by the Holy Spirit. We can come, we can be a nobody in this world, but to God, but to the Lord Jesus, we are his child. So we can come into his presence. We don't have to be, uh, you know, a great, you know, a prophet. Or, of course, it's, it's good to pursue things now. We, we need to be wise. We need to work. Uh, we need to get be the best in what God wants us to be. But even if we are nothing, I mean, even if we are just doing some something very small, we are empowered by faith in Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit. So we are not coming by works. It's not like saying, God, I've, I've preached these sermons. I've, I've 
prepared myself. I was 30 years in ministry. Now I'm coming into your presence. No, you can be, we can be one day as a believer and still come into his presence. In the same, it's God, the Lord is going to accept us both in the same way. The old bought bondage, the new covenant brings liberty. They were in bondage. Picture this, maybe they did a sin offering. They said, God, I'm a sinner. They did a sin or a guilt offering. And then they go back home. Where is that feeling? It is still there. Why? Because it's a bondage. It's going to be there in the old covenant. But in the new covenant, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. There's liberty, right? When we sin, I, I love what uh, the scriptures teach us. And it says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you. Right? Liberty. And I walk in this assurance that I'm forgiven because I've confessed my sins. With all my heart, I've confessed my sins. Right? Uh, so the old bought bondage, the new brings liberty. The old was served by earthly priests. The new is a heavenly priest. We looked at that as well. The high priest of the old covenant uh, would was a great high priest. He will go in. It was he was an earthly man, right? He was somebody who was just uh, representing the people of Israel, but he also had sin in him. There was sin, and now we have a high priest who is sinless and greater high priest, an eternal high priest. The old served a natural tabernacle, and now we are in the eternal tabernacle. I'm sure you're learning this, uh, you're learning in eschatology as well, uh, or you, you'll be learning uh, maybe next semester on the end times and how uh, about heaven and how we are partakers uh, of the things that are happening in heaven. And so the old required recurring sacrifices right if we read the levitical offerings there were many 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 sacrifices guilt offering sin offering pain offering uh and all kinds of offerings and it had to happen again and again and again but the new was one offering made once for all nothing more was needed every believer can enter the old has been removed and the new is in force. Is it important to read the old covenant? Very much. You know, some, some of them ask me, why, why should I read the new uh, old testament when the new testament is better? The old testament has such powerful principles that we can use in our lives. Like, there's so much, there's so much that we can learn. Uh, from the old covenant as well. Yes, the old covenant has been removed, the new is in force, but there are principles, there are teachings, there are learnings, there are things that we can apply in our lives. Like for example, if we all know the story of Daniel, we know the story of Joseph, Abraham, all these wonderful men of God. What does it do to us when we read it? It just brings so much of strength, it brings so much of faith in our hearts. Like it, it builds us up. So just as how the new covenant is in force, it does not mean that the, we don't read the old covenant. Remember, the Bible, the reason the Holy Spirit has put it is because every word is powerful. Every word is God's word bringing life to us. Right? So spend time, old, new, spend time reading uh, the scriptures. The new Covenant is an everlasting covenant. Now, the old covenant lasted for a while. Uh, the new covenant is an everlasting covenant. The new covenant is a more glorious covenant. Let's read this, 2 Corinthians 3, 9. Paul is writing to the Corinthians. He explains it so wonderfully here. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9. Yes, one of us, uh, please read that. Second Corinthians three nine. 
Um, for if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. Amen. Thank you, John. The ministry of condemnation, meaning the old covenant, already had glory. How much more glorious is the new covenant? And he, Paul goes on to write. He explains to them why. Moses is coming down that mountain, bringing the Ten Commandments. The people of Israel say, cover your face. The glory of the Lord is upon you. Now, that is the ministry of condemnation. That's the old covenant. The people could not see Moses because of the glory of God. How much more is glorious is the new covenant where you and I are co-heirs with Christ. We are seated with him. How much more? So Paul is drawing this comparison, saying old covenant. They could not see Moses' face. Is it cover his face? New covenant is greater than that. It's more glorious. Here's a, another important point. We need to shed off the old covenant mentality. Now, this is something that as a church, when I say church, the body of Christ globally, we need to come out of, right? Uh, not sure about other nations, but in our nation of India, there is so much of this old covenant mentality. Uh, and when I say old covenant mentality, uh, it could be smaller things that cause disruption, that cause differences among people. Uh, remember the people of Egypt? people of Israel, they came out of Egypt. What were they doing? They were very happy. They were blowing their trumpets. They were singing, praise God. I'm sure you've heard of this saying, right? It was, it took a moment to, probably a day to come from, for Israel to come out of Egypt. But it took almost 40 years for Egypt to come out of Israel. Meaning what? Two, three days down the line, they said, I wish I was back in Egypt itself. I would have eaten well. The food was better. The, the, at least we were working. We had houses. Now we don't have a place to stay. We are, live, we are out in this desert. There's no water. Why did I even make this decision? An old covenant mentality. You know, there will be times in our ministry and in things that we do, there will be people who will bring accusations against us. There will be people who will say, you know, you're not doing this right. You're not doing that right. Uh, it's very important to teach our congregation importance of uh, you know the, the the understandings of the new covenants. That's why we have a subject called hermeneutics, where we take scripture and put it into context. You know, there are many many you know speaking to this pastor young man, he was saying uh, there's division in the church. Why? One group believes that. Uh, we should not, you know, uh, we should, you should remove your footwear and come in. Now, these are urban people, right? These are people who are uh, living in cities, not villages, in cities. One group believes that uh, there should be, uh, one group believes that they should have 10, you know, singers. There should be a choir. So that became a problem. There's no choir. So, but there are already three singers there. No, no, there should be a choir. Right? So all kinds of things. Another group believe, no, you should not, uh, you know, should not make uh, too much profit in business. So all kinds of, you know, wrong ideologies will come up. But remember that you are part of the new covenant. It's not just of the law, but you're coming by grace. So there has to be shedding off of certain things, right? Uh, and so and so, it's very important to understand, especially as leaders, teach your congregation, right? Teach your congregation. I, I remember this uh, few people in our church here in Mangalore. They said we don't believe in women preaching. We we don't we don't uh, accept it. Now I had to called them, I made them sit, and I began to teach them. I began to share with them. I began to understand first, why do they say that? 
They said, no, in the old covenant, God said this, this, this. In the new covenant, she said, okay. So they said, these are the things in the new covenant. So I said, okay, let's, let's look scripturally if it's right or wrong. And then we can make a decision. So they, they pulled out scripture. I pulled out scriptures. And I pulled out scriptures only from the New Testament. And I began to show them how the Lord Jesus used women to bring the gospel to people. The church in Rome was led by a husband and a wife, Aquila and Priscilla. Lydia was a leader. There were plenty of women leading in the old covenant, in the new covenant. So I had to really teach them. I had to share with them. See, this is what's happening. This is what is, you know, in, in Christ, we are the same. Right? We are on level ground. It's the anointing, it's the grace, it's God's gifts and callings. And, and so after a couple of months, they began to understand, hey, yeah, it's it's not that only men should be pastors. No, it's it's a it's a call of God. God chooses, it's not our calling. And in the new covenant, uh, you know, God can call anybody. Uh, uh, because remember, the old covenant, uh, you know, mostly women were not allowed to do their sacrifice, do sacrifices. They were not allowed to, you know, involve in too many of these offerings and sacrifices. They were not involved. They look after the household activities, household stuff. But in the new covenant, things change. So it's very important as leaders to teach your congregation why you believe in certain things. The mistake I made is I, I thought that they will understand. No, they will not understand. We have to teach them. We have to make them understand through the scriptures. And the Holy Spirit will speak to them. What does the Bible say? The truth will set them free. Right? So now they are so open to women teaching. I made that, you know, that respected uh, 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 auntie herself to come and, you know, share and lead the uh, prayer times. She was so happy. She said, I feel so liberated. So it's very important to get off that old mindset. No, only this is how it should be done. No. And the new covenant, God can use anybody, any way, anyhow. Uh, to uh, for his kingdom, right? Uh, is the new covenant without law? The new covenant is called the perfect law of liberty. James 1.25 But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues it and, it is, and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So the new covenant is with the law but that law is a law of liberty, right? Uh, so why still read the old covenant? God has not changed. His heart, his nature has not changed. The power and the glory of God remains the same. We learn from God's workings. We learn from God's dealings, right? Uh, this wonderful aspect uh, I was reading yesterday uh, from First Chronicles, what a powerful work David did. When David became the king, so wonderful. He, he, he first thing he did is he brought the uh, Ark of the Covenant and he put it in Jerusalem and he said, we'll make a tabernacle here. And he said, what we'll do is we'll have worship in this place. So David chose 4,000 musicians. I think it's 288 prophetic singers. Now, he chose them all and he said, We'll have 24 hours of worship. So those 4,000 musicians, 288 prophetic singers, he divided it into 24 units. And each unit had a couple of musicians and singers, right? Uh, a group of musicians and singers. So, so they were assigned one after the other. Okay, this unit go in the morning. This is in the evening. This is in the night. And so David was able to have 24-7 worship in front of the tabernacle for 33 years. 24-7 worship, right? We learn so many things from the Old Testament. We draw inspiration from the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant, again, it points us to Jesus. The moment we read all of this and we, we, we look, hey, it shows that portrays Jesus. Can you picture this? 
Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego thrown into the fire. And the king himself, didn't we throw three? But there is four, and the fourth one looks like the son of man. The king recognizes in such a powerful encounter. There are types and shadows in the old covenant. right? And so many, we did look at it, and you look at it even in Christology, uh, types and shadows in the old covenant. And, and then last question here is, what old covenant practices still remain? Romans chapter 13, verse 8 to 10. Let's read that. Romans 18, verses 8 to, sorry, Romans 13, verse 8 to 10. Romans 13, 8 to 10. Yes, go ahead. Any one of us, please read. Oh, no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not be a false witness, you shall not covet. And if there's anything, any other commandment or, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Yes, um, was, yeah. Love does not harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Amen. What a powerful verse Paul is writing here. He ends that whole example. He says, this is what the commandments of the Old Testament says. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And all of those. But he ends it up by saying, love is the fulfillment of that law. So all that was done in all those commandments, all those laws in the Old Testament can be fulfilled just by one thing in the New Testament. That is through love. When we walk in love, we're fulfilling the entire Old Covenant. That's why Paul writes, and he uh, very emphatically, he writes this in 1 Corinthians 13. He, he's making them understand the church of Corinth. It is very good that you're, you know, you have these wonderful gifts of the Holy Spirit. You're, you're, you know, you're speaking in tongues, prophecy, word of knowledge. Wonderful. But all of that will cease. And if you do not, I mean, if you have all these gifts, and if you do not operate these gifts out of love, then it's of no use. There's no merit or there's no uh you know uh there's no joy in that gifts there's no reward when we minister in these gifts without love right uh, so for example if i am angry with somebody right i'm upset and angry and just you know uh, really angry with this person and I'm trying to you know, ask the Holy Spirit to speak to me and I get this prophetic word or uh, I, I get a word of knowledge, whatever it is. When I walk in that, but not out of love, I'm just a sounding gong. That's what Paul writes and he says, I'm just a sound. It, it, it has no value. Why? Because when we do not operate out of love, we will fail. Every ministry that we do, every area of our ministry should be out of love. There's no point if we don't love our husbands or wives or our families and we're trying to you know, build a church or we're trying to you know, start a ministry. Paul, uh, the Lord Jesus says it so wonderfully. He says, if you have a problem with somebody, go make things right with your brother solve that make things right then come and offer sacrifice and that will be your pleasing sacrifice unto me there are many times you know i've gone into the worship i've gone on stage beginning to uh you know lead the worship and the lord reminds me of people that i may have hurted or i have you know 
done things wrong and very unlovingly spoken or you know ministry is it's hard there are, there are a lot of things there's a lot of areas of work and it can get stressful uh, and there are times we may you know uh, lose our guard but the lord jesus reminded me of a time when you know many times especially when i go into worship i get these things, this person this person and i say god even as i worship you this morning let that not be a hindrance but lord help me to walk in love help me to walk in forgiveness help me to you know worship again it's not about the songs it's not about uh, you know is it a fast song slow song how good the song tune is all of that is good but uh it's more of the heart right uh, and when we worship out of love uh that's where god is pleased right out of the love of god uh, uh it shouldn't be just you know uh, just because i can play guitar or sing i'm doing it no uh everything should done should be done out of love but we love god we love the people of god we love to serve god uh sad to say that nowadays we are seeing uh, people getting into ministry for weird reasons very weird reasons uh, there's this young man i was speaking to his father he said i want my son to be in the ministry i said uh, why uh, he said no because uh, he he can get to travel and i want him to uh, come up with these YouTube videos, which I can share with my friends, and my friends will know that he comes on YouTube. And I thought to myself, he wants his son to join ministry so that he can come on YouTube. You see, the wrong reasons. The reason we want to join ministry, the reason we want to be in God's kingdom is because we love the Lord my, our God. Right? And there are plenty of others. You know, Some of them want to become rich. Some of them want to, you know, they don't want to work. Instead of doing a nine to five job, Monday to Friday, let me do something else uh, according to my own will. So these are all wrong reasons. And we didn't check our heart. And the Lord uh, teaches us that when we love and we walk in love, we are fulfilling the law. Right? Uh, I think we'll stop here. Uh, if we've covered about three chapters. We will we'll pick up from next week uh, and we'll Go a little quicker from next week. We'll try and uh, do as much as we can. And then we'll move into the cross. Again, the cross is also wonderful. We'll see what the cross is about, uh, how the cross has you know, uh, affected the entire world and uh, how it has you know, blessed us as, as his people. And what is it that the Lord Jesus achieved when uh, uh when he died on the cross of course all of this is not new to us uh we know all of this but it's always good to reiterate uh go back and remember uh what the lord jesus did for us so uh, so we'll close here we'll pick up from next week any thoughts any questions anybody has any questions uh, everything okay all right, so uh, let's close in prayer. Uh, Zeli, would you mind just closing in prayer for us, please? Okay, sure, Pastor. Thank you. Father God, we come before your presence in the name of Jesus. We want to thank you for this wonderful session that we had, Lord. Whatever truth that we have learned through your servant, our Pastor Paul, Lord, continue on to minister to each one of our hearts, that, Lord, that in you we have a better covenant, Lord God. Thank you for this wonderful truth, Lord. And Holy Spirit, continue on to remind us, Lord. And Lord, as we disperse from this place, I pray that Holy Spirit will continue to guide us, lead us, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great uh, day. Have a great weekend, too. Uh, God bless. Thank you, sir. We're great. I'm grateful. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pastor. God bless. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. God bless.